Hi, my name is Rebecca Mackey and I am a lifestyle and fitness coach based both in person and online. But that's not about that. This is about my struggle with mental health, how fitness kind of helps me find mental health. I'm going to apologize now for the growling dog. Um, it's just like when cars go by and I'm filming this in my living room that like faces the front of our house. Um, but if I lock her up, she'll whine too. And this is like the most comfortable place with okay lighting for me to record this. Um, so I apologize now for that. And also all my ums, uh, I'm a little anxious to do this, but I want to help people. I want to share my story. It's something that I've never really shared very publicly before, nor with, um, there's only very few close family and friends, um, that know the specifics of my story. And I just feel like in today's day and age, in my community, I know over just the last couple of years, there's been so many young people that have taken their own lives, a lot of friends and family that I know that have struggled with mental health, and it hurts. Um, it hurts me to see it. It hurts me to feel that there's like not really a place for those people to kind of turn to. Um, it's one of those things that like I don't think is talked about enough. And I think it's kind of something that like we try to push down and we try to like brush it under the rug or like, oh, we blame this or we blame family or we blame relationships or like all these things in our lives that we like push blame onto. And it's like, oh, because of this. Oh, they're like that because of this. And like, maybe you had something that triggered you, but that doesn't mean that like, that shouldn't be your only reason. And that's not okay to just brush it off as like, oh, well, they had a bad childhood and that's why they have this problem. Like they have, they struggle with mental health or, you know, they got fired from their job and that's why they went down this dark hole. Like there's sometimes just no rhyme or reason. And I want it to be okay to talk about it. I want you to know that like when you're in that deep, dark place and you want to just lock yourself in your room and not talk to anyone there are other people out there that are struggling just like you that just hearing your story could help dig them out of that deep dark place right alongside with you so my first couple episodes are just going to be my story if you want to watch for like fast forward these or just skip to like when i start interviewing some other people friends family that have also struggled with mental health i totally get it maybe my story's boring maybe you relate to it i'm not really sure i'm gonna try not to ramble but I think the first couple episodes, I'm going to try to just break it up into sections um, so I can dig like a little bit deeper and really give you like a full picture of where I was at. So I would say my anxiety and depression kind of started in like middle school, high school. Um, I think in middle school, I didn't really know what it was. I was a very insecure, self-conscious girl. And I think I had parts of it and I just didn't really know what was going on. I thought everyone had those feelings. Like everyone was overthinking. Everyone got anxious. And if I like had a sad day while well, I was just having a bad day, like I didn't think that there was more to it than that. I just thought it was normal. And I just kind of assumed that like, well, this is how everyone feels, right? No. Um, there's a lot of people that feel like that, but there's some people that will never feel that way. And that's okay too, but you shouldn't be ashamed to like share with other people that that's what's going on. Like you feel depressed. Like you aren't, it's not just like you had a bad day. Like I sad for a week, like, and like dark sadness. Like I want to shut the world down. Like I don't want to be around anyone. I don't want to do anything. And that kind of transpired into high school. Um, I was in, I would call it like an emotion, um, emotional abusive relationship. Um, I think both of us were at fault for it. I think both of us did things that hurt the other person. And in turn, it just like festered and festered. And it just became very unhealthy. And, um, and that's kind of just like what kept it going. I was so convinced that like, oh, this is fine. Like, but he loves me. And it wasn't. I spent every single day, I think it was sophomore year. I would skip chem class every morning. It was my 8 a.m. class. We used to fight the night before. I would be upset. I'd go into school. I'd go to the counselor and I would skip class. 
every mo almost every morning. It was awful. I didn't know any better. I was in denial. I think I was in denial of a lot of things in life. And I think that's where the depression side of me, like, you're going to end up alone. You're going to be alone forever. Like, I didn't want to be alone forever. And I think that's what made me, like, grasp onto that and hold that. And, like, well, if I give this up, like, I'm never going to have anyone. So I just have to suck it out and, like, stick it out. And, like, who cares if he's mean to me? Like, it's fine, right? It wasn't. And it's not. And I'm not saying it's his fault. We were both at fault for it. Um, there's things I could have done better and there's probably things he could have done better, but it's neither here nor there. Like what's done is done. And I learned that there were counselors and things that could help me. And that was something that was a resource that came into my life at that time when I needed it the most. And I'm thankful that it was there and kind of helped me cope and work through that aspect of life. Um, so I finished off high school no longer with that person um, I decided one night that I was just parting ways. And then fast forward a little bit, um, senior year, I was always a good kid. So I kind of started letting myself go. Um, I started drinking. I started partying a little bit more. Freshman year of college um, was the same sort of thing. I would go out to parties all the time because it was fun and I had a good group of girlfriends that I knew had my back no matter what. So I felt comfortable going out, going partying, and always knowing that like they got me. I got nothing to worry about. What I didn't realize is like how much of that introspective person insecure me, not feeling good enough about myself, not feeling like I belonged in school, comparing myself to the other girls on my riding team and being like, well, they're better than you. You're never going to get there. I was numbing all of that. And I didn't learn that until years later that that like self-medication of alcohol was making me feel better. Like I could be anxious all day, but the second I had a couple of drinks in me, I felt good. I felt like I could take on the fucking world. I was like, oh, I'm chatting, friends with this person and that person. And like, I could talk to anyone. And before that, I would be like this little introverted, like, sit in the corner and I'll pet the dog at the party kind of girl. So it made me feel good. It made me feel like, wow, this is like a whole different side of myself that I've never seen before. Why wouldn't I want to keep feeling this way? And then I'd wake up the next morning kind of feel like shit because you're a little hungover, but like you go through school, maybe you don't drink that night, excuse me, and then maybe you like drink the following night. And like it just kind of kept going. But in college, it was like, well, I'm in college. So like, isn't this what we do? Like, I thought so. It was like, well, you're in school. It's fine. I'm passing my classes. I'm showing up to class on time. I'm having fun. I'm meeting new people. Like, it's all good. It slowed down sophomore, junior year a little bit. Um, I was working more, so I had more responsibilities. And my home life also started to change. I bought a house with someone. We were engaged, so I wasn't going out on the weekends anymore. I felt more restricted, more like I shouldn't do that, or... I'm not allowed to do that sort of thing. Like, that's what I told myself in my head. And that was another turning point in my life, I guess. I feel like all these things happen and you start to learn from them. And from that, I realized where I didn't want to be. I wasn't content. I wasn't happy. My anxiety started to get really bad. Um, and my depression started to get really bad. I think this is going to make me emotional. Um, we had friends and family that lived with us and it caused us to fight all the fucking time. And I had no trust. Um, by this point, I think a lot of it was in my head. I like felt stuff was going on or I was like convincing myself that when I was at work or when I was at school, like something was happening. And so then I started getting anxious. 
and I started snooping. And I would go through his phone. I'd go through his phone when he was sleeping, when he was in the shower. I'd want to see what was going on. And I would find, like, naked pictures of a girl. And it would be like, oh, I send them back and forth to my coworkers. Like, it's a joke. We don't know who she is. And then I found emails from, like, a dating site. Oh, that was before we got serious. Like, I didn't know this was going to work out. And I tell you all these things because I fucking remember them. Because it sticks with you. It's one of those things, like, someone tells you something and it hurts you so much internally that that was, it was 21, 22, I'll be 31 next week. So nine years ago, and I still remember the exact comments that were made when I asked a question and how he reciprocated it. Whew. And I would just, we would drink. Um, he would have friends over. I would be like trying to fix something in the house and he would be out drinking and hanging out with his friends and like it'd be like two separate lives. I was miserable. And I was depressed. That's when I first started being like, well, this is it. Like, I'll just fucking end it. Like, if I just take myself out of the equation, I won't feel like this anymore. I won't be with someone that makes me feel so shitty. Um, I didn't get along with his parents. They called me a rich, prissy horse girl. Um, and back then I didn't have thick skin. <laughs> so I, it hurt me. Like every time I heard those comments, it tore me down like a little bit more, a little bit more. Whew. I've never really talked about all this at once. Um, and it's crazy how much you start to internalize that because it was like, well, that's just how my parents are. Like, that's just how my dad is. Don't take it offensively. It's really hard not to when the same person that tells you they love you are like, making mean comments about the way you live your life and calling you things that you're not and getting upset with you for making decisions with your significant other that really doesn't involve them because it's not their life. You're trying to start your own life, but yet they keep pushing themselves into parts of your relationship because they think they know best. And yeah, they have had their own experiences, but you know what? We're trying to start our own life. We're trying to have our own experiences as well, and we should be allowed to do that. And if we fall flat on our face, well then, okay, that happens, but we learn from it. You get back up and you start over, and it's hard when you have someone else trying to tell you how to live your life in and out, someone that doesn't agree with the way you're living your life, that thinks you're just some rich horse girl, and... Yeah, that's what they thought of me. And, like, to have – was that something that I really wanted to be with? Like, someone who I – I don't know, may or may not be cheating on me at this point, whose, like, parents think I'm just some rich bitch, and we live in a house, and I'm unhappy. I'm thinking about just ending it because I'm just so miserable, and I'm so hurt day in and day out. And – that was my, that was like my thought. Like it wasn't like I need to get out of this. It was just, it wasn't like I'm breaking up, I'm moving on. It was like a whole nother extreme. And I didn't really talk to anyone about it. Um, the people that lived with us would hear us fight at night if we got into an argument. And then you'd kind of blow it off and we'd figure it out and you'd just move on to the next day. And I don't know what overcame me. I was at breakfast or lunch, I don't remember, with a friend who used to work for my mom. I remember who I was with. And I started crying. And I just remember telling her, I can't do this anymore. I can't. I can't. I can't go through with this wedding. I can't go through with this marriage. I can't do it. Um... I told him I was moving back home. I told him I wanted a break. And I think 
a week or two had gone by. I was staying at my parents. And I was at Best Buy with my mom. He was on vacation with his family. So I was taking care of our house. With I, I had whiskey at the time, so it was eight or nine years ago. Um, and his dog was there. And I got a text from one of my friend's sisters when I was at Best Buy with my mom, because I will never forget this day, that said, have you been on Facebook today? And I was like, no. And she sent me a screenshot, and it said he was in a relationship with a girl that he had gotten in trouble for street racing with, like, a month before. And blew it off as, like, oh, she was some girl, like, we were just racing, he got a ticket, she got out of it, or whatever bullshit he fed me. And that obviously wasn't the case. I left. Uh, I don't even think I was sad at that point, I think I was more pissed. And I think I felt just, like, stupid. Like... I put the blame on myself. Like, I must have done something to make him want to go on with someone else. And I said I was out. I moved all my stuff out. I took my dog with me. I took all my stuff. I had my house, my name, not been on the deed of that house. I probably would have, like, smashed in the toilets or the mirrors or the windows or something. Because I was pissed. I was staying there taking care of our stuff, even though I wanted a break, and he had just like that moved on. Like, I never even existed. Like, I was just, uh, like, a, you know, breeze that just blew by, and here comes the next one. And just like that, I was not even part of it. And I think... It was what, another one of those things I internalized. Um, from that point, I had a decent job. I was working in the horse industry. I was traveling all the time. And I had left shortly before that. I gave up that job because I wanted to start a family. I thought we were going to be a family. We were going to start living. You know, we were already had a house. We were engaged. Like... Why do I want to live on the road when I'm trying to have a family? Well, at that point, I wasn't doing any of that. I moved back home with my parents. I started riding for some people on the side. I was working at my parents' business. I really had, like, no direction or flow of what I, where I wanted to go in life, where I thought I was going in life. I didn't know. I was just kind of living. I wasn't really intentionally doing anything I was just going day by day and just like trying to keep myself busy I think when I get into my worst spots excuse me I say as busy as I can because it doesn't give me a chance to sit alone in my own thoughts and think about everything I just I just like go there is no off switch. It's just foot on the gas. You're just going so that you can't send your own thoughts. You can't stop to think about it. You can't stop to be depressed. You can't stop to be anxious. Like, there is no time for any of that. Because you're just busy, busy, busy. Go, 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 go. And I sort of live my life like that now, right now. Right now, still. Um, I'll bite off as much as I can and then just run with it. And some days or some weeks is when I'm so stressed or so anxious or know I have all this stuff to do. But, like... Oh, it's just like one more thing. And I feel like, I think it goes back to my old ways of just like, I don't, I've never thought I was good enough for so long. And sometimes I still question my own self-worth that I felt like if I did more and more and more, somehow that would help me feel better about myself, would make me feel like worthy, like I was good enough for this person or that person or myself. And then at the end of the day, like really, myself is the only one that fucking matters. Like, who cares about everyone else? Because how quick they can just drop you. Like, you need to be worthy enough for yourself. You need to love yourself enough to put yourself first and fuck everyone else. Like, they can follow second, but if you don't love yourself and you're not true to yourself, how can you be true to someone else? You can't. And that's something that I never realized 
um, not through high school, not through college. I put everyone else before me. I put the people I was in relationships with, the guys I was dating before me, always. I always felt like that was my job. Like I had to do right by them. I had to like keep them happy and do what they wanted me to do or needed from me. Like I needed to support them. If that was like clean the house or do this or cook dinner or do that. Like I did what made them happy. It wasn't necessarily what made me happy, but it's what made them happy. But to make me feel worthy, that's what I had to do. I didn't, that's what I thought I had to do. And it's definitely something I still struggle with is like feeling my own self worth. I hit some rougher patches after that. I started working for a fan. I'm trying to figure out my timeline of like when I worked versus how this all happened. Um, of like if I worked here first or if I lived here first. It's crazy how when you, I'm going to look for pictures to give me some better timelines here. It's crazy how when like you're just so hyper focused on other things that you kind of forget like where that time went. Like I look back now on those years and I'm like, wow, like I can't imagine, like, I don't know how I like coming from there to where I am now is crazy. But to look back and think like that was something I did is just wild. Like, I can't believe that's happening. I can't believe that was going on. Um, so I would say like 2016, probably. Um, I was serving. I'm trying to find out exactly. I know where I was in 2017. Yeah, 2016. Um, so I've been done school now for three years. I quit my job. I ended my relationship. And I moved back home. All within three years of graduating from college. I graduated in December of 2013. Sorry, I wanted to get some years to have some like timeline for you guys. And I was serving um, at this local like bar and grill place. And I got to know some of those people there. Excuse me, I moved in with one of the girls that was working there. And excuse me, we had fun. Um, I lived there for a couple months with my dog. And, uh, I didn't feel as depressed. Um, we were doing things, we were going out, um, we were going to, like, the beach, we'd go to this place or that place, and I started to feel like, the restaurant people were like kind of my people. Um, and I'll backtrack a little bit. I told you I may ramble. Um, one of my good friends and I after school would meet there on the weekend. Well, it was like Wednesday nights. We'd go play trivia, hang out, and drink. And it went to one of those things where so this is like probably 2014, 2015, somewhere in there leading into 2016. Um, so like a good two, three years in there were like consistently going to the bar. Like we'd go play trivia, have a couple of double jack and cokes. Like it's a couple of drinks. I'm fine. What I didn't know at the time was that like those couple of drinks would lead to like me driving intoxicated back to my parents' house. 
I was numbing myself. I got out of school. I wasn't doing something major in the horse industry. I left that job. I left the guy that I was with. I'm now like single in my 20s just with like no real direction. I'm working here and there and this and that and like doing all these random jobs. But like don't really have anything to show for myself. Like I have a college degree. I'm not even using it. But I was going out and I was having fun and I was meeting people at the restaurant and I was making decent money and like life was fine. And then I would like wake up one morning and I would have like a fucking cosmic brownie, you know, like those brownies with like the sprinkle things on them, like in my bed, not knowing how I got home, not really remembering how I got home and then realizing like, holy shit, you drove yourself home last night. That's stupid. First off, don't ever drink and drive more to that story coming up. Um, but it was close to my house. I lived at home. I like knew those roads like the back of my hand. I thought I had it. And I did. And I didn't think it was a problem. It was just like, oh, it's one night. What's one night? And then one night would turn into like one night and a weekend night. And that vicious cycle of that self numbing came back. I just kept numbing that feeling, like that feeling of not being worthy enough, that depression of like, oh, well, I'm sad. Well, I'll just drink. It'll make me feel better because I'll be more talkative. I'll be more outgoing. I'll be better. And then like, you're like, oh, wait, but de alcohol is a depressant. So like, in all reality, at the end of the night, I was, or the next morning, I wake up more depressed than I was the night before. And then you start all over again because you're like, well, it's just going to make it better, right? Makes me more outgoing. So who wouldn't want to? And it just, it just keeps cycling. You just keep letting it happen. Not realizing that you have a problem. And it can become a problem. When you're in college, you're like, oh, I'm in college, so it's fine. And then when you get out of college, you're like, well, I'm just out of college. Or it's only one night a week, so I'm fine. And you think you're fine until all those nights start adding up and they keep coming together or closer and closer together and you don't realize how much that that changes because it happens more and more frequently to the point of you're like, well, wait a second. Is this like the second, third night in a row? Like, I'm not sure. And it just, it keeps going. And it makes you feel okay. Like, it made me feel better. It made me feel more confident. It made me feel more outgoing. So I just kept doing it. I thought I was fine. I eventually, so fast forward to like, so 26, end of 2016, beginning of 2016, I was doing that. I went back to working at a barn full time. I guess like beginning yeah middle summer ish um probably like april ish maybe um march or april of 2017 um so this was four years out of school and i went to work for a full-time barn gig and i loved it i was single i had my dog i lived with them we lived on the road we traveled to horse shows it was great i was back living the life I was back to like doing what I loved and enjoying it and I thought life was good. I seemed okay and then I would hit like a rough patch and I would just, by this point I was drinking less. But my depression was still there and it wasn't something, it was something that I would try to hide. And I got pretty good at hiding because I was in the customer service business. Like I had to deal with people at the horse show. So I would just put on a fake smile and a happy day and be like, hey, how are you? I'm great. Like, how are the kids? This, that, the horse, this, you know, whatever it was. Like people had no idea 
you look at some of the happiest people or what you think are the happiest people and little do you know that at night they cry themselves to sleep or they drink themselves to sleep or they go eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's and to like cope with those emotions. I was there. I, by this point, was like eating shitty food to make myself feel better. Did it make me feel better? Not really, but like it was better than, in my opinion, at the time, it was better than drinking, which it probably was. It was healthier. I thought it was um, because it didn't give me those feelings. I was still able to do my job and I wasn't drunk, so it was fine, right? I would just like eat my emotions away. <laughs> and that's not helpful either. But it was just one more thing of like, well, this will just make me feel better. Like the food tastes good going down. It takes my mind off of still feeling like, well, maybe I'm not quite good enough for this job. Like maybe I'm not quite cut out for this. So I'm just going to, again, push it down like deeper and deeper and hope that it just, it's going to help it, right? Like it'll, it'll just get better. It doesn't. I had seen a therapist prior to this and I was, I believe, still seeing her while I was there for a little while and just kind of talking through everything, working through everything, talking to her about my drinking, talking about my anxiety and it helped. And then if I would have a really bad day at work, like, the we were like, I want to say oil and water, but it wasn't that bad. Um, I just had a different upbringing. So I felt like I was trying to convey someone that I wasn't. Um... And I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like I wasn't of that class and that I was looked down upon for that. And it's probably all in my head, but that's how I felt. So you get days where you're like, wow, I'm, I didn't know how old I was at the time. Um, and it's like, okay, 25, 26. I guess. And you're like, where am I going with my life? Like, is this where I want to be? Is this what I want to do? You're looking at all these people you went to, I was looking at all these people I went to high school with, people that I went to college with. They're like living their dream jobs or they're married and they're having kids and they're doing this and this. And I'm like, well, I'm just living on the road. And I loved it. I loved parts of it. But there was so much more to life that I wanted and I felt like I had to have all the answers right that second. And when I didn't have them, I started to feel like crap again. I started to feel that black cloud of depression that just took over me. And I didn't know what to do. And drinking really wasn't an option. We would drink like occasionally at night at the horse shows, but like not really. Um, and I was working. Like I took pride in that. I wanted to be a role model for the people that were around me. I wanted to be on top of my game for, I was working with live animals. I wasn't just driving at home at the end of the night. I wasn't in college anymore. I had more responsibility. So it was different. But that pain and insecurity was still there. It still kept creeping up. And so instead of drinking, I would turn to self-harm. Um, I don't remember the first time I did it. I remember when I stopped. I remember having an awful day and just feeling like shit. Feeling like you're not enough. And like, I couldn't, I had convinced myself and I knew that like drinking was no longer the answer. And I didn't want to do that with my responsibilities. So in turn, I was like, well, if I just hurt myself just enough to make the emotional pain that I'm feeling, like the physical pain would take away from that emotional pain, 
I could wear a long sleeve. I could go back to work and no one would ever know. And that's what I did. I would do it. I don't know how many times I did it. I only did it on my left wrist and right handed. I only did them small because I was convinced that they were small enough it would like bleed sometimes, scab up, and like it would heal and I'd wear long sleeves and no one ever noticed. I don't know if anyone ever noticed. No one ever asked me about it. I never, I've told two people about it, maybe a couple more since then. Um, so probably closer to four or five people about it now that I think about it a little harder. And now all of you. I would do it when I was hurting for myself or other people. I, through the end of my time at that place, I started seeing someone that was working the horse shows that was probably just as emotionally unstable as I was. Uh, so that was great. We were like fuel to each other's fires. Um, he had other choices of numbing his pain than I did. Um, I used alcohol, he used other substances and it wasn't healthy. And I felt like if I get sober, he'll get sober. Let me break it to you. It's probably not going to happen. You all have to have your own journey. And... If he was hurting, or I was hurting for him, I would do it. I felt like it just took the pain away from both of us and didn't really know. Did it take my emotional pain away from like hurting for him? Yes. And then emotionally, I was just tearing myself down a little bit more. I went to a friend's wedding. I was convinced I couldn't go by myself. So I convinced her to add a plus one. Maybe it wasn't that hard to convince her. I don't remember. And I was in the wedding. And if you're seeing this, I am sorry. Because I don't remember much of that night. I do remember being present for pictures. I do remember being the girl with the vodka and the orange juice. Getting ready for that day. Because I was like, well... Here's one more person, like, doing everything I hope to have, doing everything I want, and here I am, like, working, and I'm just living life, and just back to that, like, alone, feel like you're in a hole, like, feel like you're in this dark bubble by yourself, and, like, it's just you. And I felt like that for a, lo a long time years. I always thought it was me against the world and I didn't know how to let other people in. I didn't know how to ask for help or tell someone that I was struggling with that darkness. So instead I numbed it. I was drunk by the end of that wedding. My parents were there. My brother was there. I have pictures from it. By the end of the night you can tell like my eyes were glassed over. I don't remember getting back to the hotel room that night. Um, I woke up and went to work the next day. Um, I think I only took off the day before and that day of, and then I went back to work. Um, it was an outlet for a night and then I went right back to work. But that feeling of just not being good enough just kept coming back up, kept festering, kept just, and it got to the point where like I was hurting myself more to just numb that emotional pain. I wanted the physical pain to make the emotional pain go away. And it did. It did for that like split second of like, ouch, that fucking hurts. And then the emotional pain would drain. But then that emotional pain creeps back up. And it's just it goes and go. It's just like a cut one after the other after the other and you're trying to numb one pain with the other or vice versa and 
I wasn't doing it in a healthy way. I wasn't finding a good way to overcome all of this. I didn't know how to stop. I didn't know how to make it any better. I called a tattoo parlor and I made an appointment to go get a tattoo. And to me, I had told myself I wouldn't do it anywhere else. So to me, making that appointment to cover it up was forcing me to stop. I knew I wouldn't want to ruin my tattoo. And I also knew that I wouldn't do it anywhere else. So I just went in. They had an opening like two days later, the day after I called. I went in. I said, I don't know what I want, but I need to make this go away. And the guy was like, well, you know, some of these are kind of fresh. Like, it's not, I don't recommend, like, covering them up for the scarring and this and that. And, like, it's not the best. Like, you might want to hold off. And I was like, I can't. I need to do this tonight. Um, today. I need, I need it right now. And that's, so I did. We did it. Um, I wanted something that made me feel strong, something that made me feel tough, something that I was like, this is it. Like, I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to move on from this chapter of my life. Uh, so we did a bunch of sketches. That's, if you're on uh, audio, you're not going to be able to see this. But I'll try to... Even see it that way. You can kind of see my kind of turn my thing down. So my eye, there's a diamond in the middle, and then it says strength. That's um that was something I covered them all up. I covered up all the scars. Um you can definitely see them peeking through. Um it's so it's just one of those reminders kind of of where I used to be how far I've come and it was just that instant spontaneous choice of I gotta do this and I gotta do it now and if I don't do it, I'm going to keep hurting myself. I don't know what. I saw a picture on Pinterest that had tattoos like sleeves and something about I something about having the tattoos to no longer hurt myself or I know I won't want to hurt the art so I no longer hurt myself something like that and I forget why I stumbled upon it and maybe it was just the universe's way of telling me like here's your sign but I was like that's what I gotta do that's it like that's what I'm doing I had always said that like oh I won't do it on my wrist or my fingers I have two tattoos on my fingers now I have this on my other wrist for my sister um I knew I had to do something and that's what I did and it was just like I said that instant spontaneous like you're fucking doing this right now because I knew if I didn't I probably wasn't gonna stop maybe it would have gotten worse maybe things maybe I I don't know I don't know I really don't my take my own life thoughts weren't really there anymore because this was a way that made me feel better instantly and I loved what I did I loved being around the horses and I think that in of itself was a little bit of therapy for me every day just to be around 
animals that at 12, 1400 pounds can read your emotions and you have a bad day, you just go sit in the stall and just hang out with the horse for 20 minutes. I grew up with horses. And as that awkward kid, tall and lengthy, that just wanted to spend time at the barn, like, that's where I felt safe. So that transition and that time in my life helped me move away from the dark, dark sides of depression into a little bit more light. I still had poor coping mechanisms. I still didn't feel like I was good enough. But I was slowly starting to figure, I don't know. I don't think I, I was coping with life in a different way. And to me, it was healthier than just drinking and numbing all the pain. I left that job in November of, yeah, 2017. You're okay. Um, I emotionally couldn't take it. Um, it was me. I'll full heartedly, wholeheartedly admit to that. Um, it just wasn't where I wanted to be. It just wasn't my environment, the atmosphere. It wasn't healthy for me. It wasn't healthy for where I was at. Um, we didn't leave on great terms. I'm not proud of it. It's probably one of the very few jobs that I didn't leave on great terms. Um, but I needed to do it. I needed to walk away from that situation and change the trajectory of what I was going to do next. I, yeah, October, November. So I left in November. In October, I was back to the rambling. Uh, I'm going to end here for this episode then. I was out of dinner. I was close to the Delaware border. I was out with a friend. I had three too many margaritas. And by three too many margaritas, I mean I had three very strong margaritas. Um, they tried to get me to stay the night and I was like, no, nah, fine. I'll drive home. I'm good. It wasn't. Um, I don't remember much of it. I remember thinking I was okay. I remember thinking I had it. I got pulled over. I blew into the breathalyzer. I don't remember if he told me what I blew or not. I was asked to get out of the car. I had to do a field sobriety test. I was in flip-flops. I don't know if I could do that sober in flip-flops. So drunk in flip-flops, it was definitely not going well. I later found out they pulled me over for speeding and I was swerving. I think it was a 35 and I was doing like 40 maybe and swerving. They pulled me over. I pulled over right away. Um, there were two cops by this point. And I just remember my world came crashing down. Like, this is it. Like, you really fucked up. You really did it this time. Um, she always knows when I get upset. Um, uh, yeah, there was no, there was no way back from that. I was bawling my eyes out. I knew I probably shouldn't have been driving. I'm forever grateful that I never hurt anyone else. That I didn't hurt myself. That I didn't crash my car. 
that I walked away, that no one else was involved. It was just me and my vehicle. They took me to the hospital. They drew my blood. I got my mug shots taken. I got my fingerprints taken. My brother, I think, later found those mug shots. I don't think they're pretty. I'm sure it was a wreck. Actually, no, it was a wreck, so I'm sure those pictures are awful. I've never actually looked for them. Um, I called my sister because there was no way I was calling my parents. They towed my car. They took it to an impound lot. I the cop told me he'd take me to my sister was going to pick me up. So he told me he would take me to like the end of his jurisdiction as far as he could um, to wait for my sister. So I sat in the back of the cop car while I played country music. I think we were like in a Wawa parking lot or something. And we waited for my sister. And he told me it was going to be okay. He didn't have to wait for me. Or with me. He could have left me there. He could have left me to wait for my sister. Or like left me, I don't even know, in a holding cell or something, but he didn't. I don't know really how that works. Um, I'm pretty sure I went right back to work the next day. And my sister and her boyfriend went and got my car out of the impound lot. It was a couple hundred dollars. And that was my biggest wake up call yet. That's when I knew I really had a serious problem. And I had to change something. I could have hurt someone else. Again, I could have hurt myself. I'm grateful I didn't. But that was my rock bottom of my depression. That was my rock bottom of my anxiety. I... It just went back to the drinking. I went back to knowing that a couple of drinks would make me feel good. Would make me be outgoing. And I feel great, so why not? But why not? Because you hurt someone. You hurt yourself. You wake up the next day and think, what in the world was I thinking? I was lucky to be alive. Again, lucky to not hurt anyone else. And I knew it was going to be a bumpy road ahead. But it really forced me to dig deeper into myself, dig deeper into my anxiety, what was causing it, my negative self-talk, why I was numbing myself all the time, why I wanted to hurt myself, then feel the emotional emotions I was feeling. And... Yeah, just get out of my own way, basically. Um, yeah, that was a big pivotal po moment in my life. Um, I am going to continue with the rest of that DUI story in my next episode. I'm going to try to record it this week. Um, I appreciate you listening. I feel like I've rambled a lot. I also feel like we all deal with anxiety and depression in different ways. This was my way. Um, my way involved alcohol. My way involved binge eating. And it's how I coped. Right or wrong, it's what I did. I self-harmed. I wanted to numb that pain. I wanted to numb that depressional, emotional roller coaster that I put myself on day in and day out because it, I hated it. It sucked. 
And to me, that seemed better than taking my life. At that point, I had talked myself down and out of that, that I no longer thought I would ever be able to take that action to the full, like, like fully. And so alcohol and self-harm was, that was my, that was my vice. And that's, that's what helped. Or so I thought. It helped me at the time. And it also hurt me more at the time. So I'm going to stop there for now so I don't ramble anymore. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. If you, it's going to sound like the end to one of those commercials. Um, if you're struggling, if anyone you know is struggling, reach out to them. I will tell you right now that in my deepest, darkest moments, the last thing I wanted to do was reach out to someone else and be like, hey, I'm feeling super depressed. I'm feeling super down in the dumps. Like, I might cut. Can we talk? I just didn't. I didn't want to talk to anyone. That was part of it. I would rather hurt myself or go have three drinks than go talk to someone about it because I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. And I thought I was alone. So if anyone has ever opened up to you about it or you're seeing signs of it in someone else, please, please, please just go reach out to them. A simple, hey, how are you? Hey, just checking on you. Pick up the phone and call them. You could be that person that changes their outlook of the day. We're not always going to reach out to you. We don't always want to talk. Sometimes we just want to fall in our little holes and not come out for the day. So reach out to someone you care about. Tell your friends. Tell your family. You love them. You care about them. You are here for them. Because one day they will decide to open up and share their story. But in the meantime, be there for them. That's the best thing you can do. Thanks for listening to Inside My Headspace. More to come.